Hi Pathway family, I'm Pastor Andrew and it's so good to have you here with us for church this morning. As we get ready for this morning's uh, study, let's go ahead and enter into a time of worship. Strength. 
Hello and welcome here with us today. Uh, if you've been following us in the, la in the last, last couple of weeks, you'll know that we were just in our series called Cosmic Lens where we explored some of the spiritual warfare that goes around goes around, goes on around us and the, and the armor of God that can protect us from these things. And we did that from the book of Ephesians. Um, today we're going to be going back into the book of Ephesians for a message called Get Equipped. And this message is, I, th I feel like it's really important. Um, I, know, I remember being a believer for many years of my life and not necessarily knowing what to do with my faith. I, I mean, I had this faith, I knew I believed in God, um, but I didn't know what I was to do with it. Um, sometimes I felt the pressure of ministry and like feeling like I had to be the one to be able to, to, to witness to people perfectly and, and to be able to care for people perfectly and to do all these things immediately. And I felt over, almost, almost, almost overwhelmed by them. And it kind of, I kind of froze in it and I, I didn't end up doing a lot with my faith. And, and there are some pitfalls to, to not being equipped in your faith. And so we're going to look at those today in our, in our passage. And so we're going to start off today by reading this passage together and having a word of prayer. So why don't we start off in Ephesians 4, verses 1 to 16. And this is what it says. You can read along with me. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens, in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ gave himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by the every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Let's have a word of prayer together. Uh, dear Father, we just want to thank you for today. And Lord, thank you for each individual that's, that's watching this, this sermon today. Uh, we just pray that as we go through this, that you would give us a deeper understanding of what it means to be equipped in our faith, um, what you've given for us to be equipped in our faith so that we can move forward in confidence um, toward, and move towards maturity uh, as a body of believers. Lord, thank you so much for people watching. Pray you bless this, this time together. We pray this in your name. Amen. 
Okay, so before we talk more in depth about some of that stuff, I want to tell you a little. I want to tell you a story of a time when I was really unequipped for a certain situation. So if, going back a few years, I took a trip to Hawaii. It was kind of a trip on a whim. Uh, I didn't really have a plan. All I, all I had was a ticket. I had some Airbnb and I had a vehicle and I was just going to kind of figure things out when I got there. Uh, so, I went, so I got there and my first day there, I, I, was, I went out and explored and I heard about this awesome trail that they had. It's called the Captain Cook Monument Trail. It's this four mile hike, two miles that goes downhill to like the coast where there's this inlet where it's very, there's a very famous monument there for, from Captain Cook and there's a really good views and snorkeling. And then there's another, and the only way to get back is to go back up two miles the other direction. And uh, so I decided I was going to go and take this, this trail and, and see what it was all about. So I went and I got myself ready and I'm here at this trail. And before I get onto this trail, I see a warning sign. Um, and the warning sign, you know, kind of detailed the course and, and cautioned people that, you know, this, cor this, this trail, it was physically demanding. Uh, during the hottest part of the day, there's no shade on the trail. Like there's, like there's no real trees or anything or grass. It's just bare open trail. Uh, and that many hikers had to actually be airlifted out of this trail because they weren't able to complete it or they got injured on this trail. Well, I saw this warning sign and I thought to myself that, you know what, I'm pretty young, I'm pre in pretty good shape. This is probably not going to be a big deal. I'm just going to go for it. So I, and I had lots of water. I had five bottles of water. I had hiking boots on. I thought I was good to go. So I, go, I proceed to go downhill to this place and the whole way downhill, it's, it's super easy and it's super light. Uh, it's some views of the ocean. It's mostly like molten rock from the volcano activity. Uh, and we get down to the bottom and it's beautiful. There's a lot of a lot of really amazing views down there. You can see people snorkeling. There's not a lot of people down there. Uh, there's a couple of couples. One of them I remember in particular because the one guy was wearing a Speedo and that just kind of burned into my mind. And so I, I, st I stayed down there for a couple of hours. I'd gone through a couple of bottles of water and... I decided I was going to go back up up the trail, and so I start going up the trail. And the, you know, the speedo guy and his wife pass me on the trail, and I'm like, okay, they're 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 cruising. Uh, I make it about a third of the way up the trail, and I mean, I'm down to like half a bottle of water left, and I'm getting lightheaded, and there's no shade, and I'm getting hot and tired, and I can't even make it more than like 30 steps without having to stop. And I, I realize that I'm starting to get into trouble. And I remember sitting down and there's like this thin little tree that, that was kind of growing out there and there's hardly any shade. It was like a thin line, but I was sitting underneath it, you know, trying to, trying to get some shade out of it and just like remember praying to God and being like, God, this is, this is really dumb. Uh, I'm in real trouble here. Um, and I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. And so I, I continued to make small progress. I would take 30 steps at a time. You know, my water is still going down and I'm trying to conserve it. Um, and then as I keep on going, all of a sudden I see Speedo guy and his wife ahead of me and they had, and they, they were still there and I, I got closer and closer and they told me like, I guess they had seen that I was struggling a little bit and they decided that they were going to wait for me. And so when I got to them, they're like, yeah, we're going to, we're going to stick with you up the rest of this trail. And it was amazing that they did so because there was, I don't know if there would have been a way for me to do it on my own. And they helped me out with water. And every, every, even though I could only sometimes like only go a hundred steps at a time before I had to take a break. Uh, you know, maybe it's because I'm from Manitoba, I'm not used to walking up inclines and the whole way was an incline. Uh, maybe that had something to do with it. Um, but it, yeah, I really struggled and it was really great that these people were able to help me. And the point of this whole story is that I started on this trail thinking that I was equipped or thinking that I was prepared for it, but really I wasn't. I wasn't equipped to, to take this, to do this trail at all. And because of that, I fell into some real danger. And as we're going to see today, there are also some real spiritual dangers that we can fall into when we as believers don't equip ourselves or when we're not equipped. We can fall victim to these things and that's actually a real danger for us. <clears throat> and if you've just watched our last series uh, on spiritual warfare, you'll know, you kind of have an idea of, of, of the spiritual warfare struggle that's going on. And if you haven't, I'd encourage you to go back and look through the last five weeks when we talked about them to get kind of a broader understanding of what some of that war spiritual warfare looks like and how we, what we can do to protect ourselves. <clears throat> so we're going to look at our, the text that we read a bit earlier in a little bit more depth. And we're going to kind of break it down step by step to kind of get the full meaning of what it says together and how we're really supposed to become equipped to, to, uh, to yeah, to how, to, how we're to be equipped in the body and as, as people who are believers. 
So some background on the book of Ephesians. Uh, the author identifies himself as Paul, and this is a letter, which means that it was written to a church and delivered to them. And so really the, the letter is meant to be read all at once. Um, there's kind of two sections to this letter. The first, you know, chapters one to three is kind of doctrine where Paul kind of really talks about um, what, the, what, the, what the church is to believe and kind of um, how Jesus' sacrifice is sufficient as a, a sacrifice for, for sin and how people can have salvation through him. Not just the Jews, but also the Gentiles, the people who were not Jews. Um, and they, how they, this, this, this division was no longer there and how people were together in Christ. Really amazing. Um, and then chapters four to six are kind of the practical application of like, okay, so knowing the, the truth about God and knowing the truth about Jesus who saved us, how do we now live that out in our lives? Uh, and so this whole book ties in together. So if you know if you were looking at chapter four today, but if you have a chance to read chapters one to three to get to to, to broaden your perspective of chapter four in your own time, I'd greatly encourage you to do that and tie it in with with chapter six that we talked about in the last few weeks uh, with the armor of God. <clears throat> so we're going to start off with verse one here. So here Paul says, "As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received." Basically, what he's saying here is like, understand what, I, what I've told you. Chapters 1 to 3, that's when he's, ta- when he's giving that doctrinal piece of like, you know, Jesus' sacrifice brings us together. We're all saved by him. We can have faith in him. And so we're supposed to understand what has been done for us. And then we're supposed to show it in the life that we live. It says, live a life worthy of this calling that you've received. When we understand who Christ is, it should affect the way that we live. Let's continue. Ephesians 4, 2 to 3. And then it says, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. This, you know, when we accept self, when we accept Christ as our Savior, when we acknowledge what He's done for us as taking the penalty on the cross for our sins, this amazing thing happens where we become saved, where He imparts His righteousness on us, even though we don't deserve it. But there's another really amazing thing that happens as well. And we actually become united into this body of believers who have this shared common faith. And it's, it, says to, it says here that it says that we're make, to make every effort to keep the unity, which, mean, which implies that the unity is there when we accept Christ. Like, this is not a unity that we create with one another. It's a unity that has been given to us uh, through the Spirit by the, by the power of God. And now we're supposed to keep this unity. And, and it kind of says how we're supposed to do it with one another. It says, be completely humble and gentle. You know, don't consider yourself and your, you know, your, your opinions as higher than another person's. And, you know, be gentle with them. Be patient with one another and bear with one another. It's this idea of walking alongside someone. And so when we, when we see this, it's like, okay, it's immediately putting into perspective, you know, this family that we're called into and kind of how we're supposed to interact with each other. <clears throat> Let's go to four to six. There is one body and one spirit. Yes, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all. <clears throat> So we know that we've been called into this body where we're supposed to have unity. And, but that unity is challenging because, you know, if we're being honest, we're all different people and we all have different thoughts and opinions and we do things a bit differently than one another. And so what, four, what chapters 4 and 6 here kind of do is emphasis, emphasize what we have in common, the things that really unite us. And this is, what it's, this is what it's saying that we have in common. It says that we have one body and one spirit. We're part of this one body together as believers. And we have this one spirit that joins us. Just as you were called to the one hope when you were called. We've been called uh, by the hope of Christ. We've been, we have this expectation of being saved and knowledge of it. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who's over all and through all and in all. And so with these commonalities that we have as we become believers, you know, these, these are the essentials. These are the things that we have in common. Because we have these things in common, we can be united with one another. You know, being united isn't this idea that we all become exactly the same. Um, we're still going to be different people. But having these similarities allows us to be united together. And that crosses, crosses a lot of different boundaries. It crosses, you know, 
political boundaries. We can we can be united to people who have different political views than us because the, the, the political view isn't what is uniting us. What's uniting us is the one spirit, the one body, the one Lord, the one Father. You know, the faith that we have is the same. We can agree with people who are racially different, have different ages than us, you know, all the differences that we have as people, you know, people who worship differently, people who love to raise their hands in the air and like be in, be in, be in the, the, the moment. And those who just prefer to like have their hands at the side and want to be, think it's too, it's, it's, it's too extravagant to raise your hand. I mean, these people, we, we can be united with each other because it's not about how we do these things. It's about what we have in common. And Paul highlights these things in chapters four and six. <clears throat> And then in, in 4 verses 7, it says, 4 verses 7 to 10, it says, But to each one of us, he has, yeah, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, When he ascended on high, he took many captives, and he gave gifts to his people. Now what does, it, now what does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So here it's talking about how, you know, the same God that came to earth and was with us is the same God that left. And he's the same God that gave us grace and the one who gave us gifts to his people. So we acknowledge that when he came, it was God came and he left and he gave us these gifts to use. And these are, gifts are not something that we earned, it's not something we've deserved. It's something that by his grace he has given to us. <clears throat> and so now we're going to kind of get into the actual equipping part. So remember we talked about how this is about to get equipped. And this is kind of the framework that we want to have when we think about what it's like to get equipped. You know, the unity of the spirit, uh, you know, treating each other in love and patience and, and gentleness. Our commonality in, in the things that we share, the one faith, the one father. Um, now, and with this context, with this framework that we've built, or that Paul has built rather, in these, in these chapters, we now look at what, it like, what it's like to become equipped. So in Ephesians 4, verses 11 to 12, it says this, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up. Okay, so we talked a little bit about how God came down and he went up and he gave gifts to his people. And he specifically gave this, this certain set of people or these certain gifts to a certain set of people in order that the whole church body be able to, to be equipped. And those people are the, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. I don't know if that, if that I, or well, how should I say this? I think when I was a younger believer, or when I was new to my faith, or even when, you know, I've, when I was in my faith for many different years, I thought that I had to just kind of develop these skills and, and know how to do it on my own. Like I had, like I was just supposed to evangelize to people and I was just supposed to, to instinctively know how to care for people and, and all these different things. And I never really realized that there's an equipping process that also takes part. I may have certain gifts to give to others, but um, when it comes to being equipped with these things, you know, God has given us the church body and, and certain people in that church body to be able to equip us. And I think we should touch a little bit on apostles and prophets because their function is a little bit different nowadays than what we might think of, you know, back in the, back, back in the time of, of the Bible. Um, and, and mostly because the original apostles are people that were chosen by Jesus. You know, they witnessed his resurrection and they were authoritative in the early church. And like, that's kind of where we get our New Testament from. Apostles today, um, you know, we don't, they don't add new books to the, to the Bible. They're not, they weren't, they weren't there to see Jesus as, uh, you know, in life or in his resurrection. And so, you know, apostles may still be chosen to, to create new things and to do like, um, you know, start something new or to be groundbreaking in that, in that same way, but they're not given that same authority as, as the original apostles were that followed Christ. Kind of in the same way, the original prophets, you know, we read about them in the Old Testament. And these original prophets for the, for the, for the nation of Israel were also authoritative. authoritative. Uh, they spoke on behalf of God, and they spoke to either the king or to, to the people to let them know what God was thinking. And, you know, they, they were held in high regard, but they also had, they also had to measure, the, measure to the level of being a prophet. You know, I mean, if they, were, if they were proven to be false, if the prophecies didn't come true, their penalty was death. 
And so, I mean, I'm not sure everybody was rushing to, to want to become a prophet because the penalty of it was, was severe and you had, to really be, you had to really be hearing from God. And so today people um, who claim to be prophets or who are prophets, you know, it's not so much that they ha- carry that same authority that the Old Testament um, prophets did, but they speak in consistency with Old Testament and New Testament scriptures. So someone who's speaking a prophetic word or speaking as a prophet may be speaking what the, the will of God without necessarily speaking about the future. They may speak about the future, but that doesn't that's not necessarily needed. And if you ever want to know if someone's telling you the truth, if it's coming true, then then maybe start to pray about it and see if that some, this person maybe has that gift. And if it doesn't come true, then you know that this person isn't really a prophet and their prophecies is, are are not really real. But they're basically they're, the, the role of a prophet is to speak the will of God. And so there's a little bit of differences in between the, those two offices and some of what we read in the, in the Bible and some of what we interact with today. But these, these section of, or these, uh, these, these, or what's listed here as the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers, these are the ones who are to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And who are the saints? The saints is, are the, is the body of Christ. So if you're a believer, you're one of the saints who are to be equipped for the work of ministry. And this is kind of where we all come together as a church and we realize like, okay, this is something that we do together. This isn't something that one person does or that, you know, a handful of people do, but this is actually intended to be something that we all do. Um, we're all called to be equipped for the work of ministry. <clears throat> and that word equip in the Greek is it's katar, katartis, Catartismos. I'm gonna. I'm probably butchering that. Um, and that word equip is is the fuller meaning of it is to kind of to perfect or to mend or to bring to completion. So it's the role of these people to kind of to guide people into their giftings and and to 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 bring them to a place where they able where they're able to exercise the work of the ministry. <clears throat> so we see these. You know, there's two these two kinds of responsibilities. It's the responsibility of the people who are appointed to, to, equip the, the, to have equipped the saints, and that's given by God. It says that Christ himself appointed this, so it's not like, you know, we didn't, we, we didn't, um, we didn't um, force it, that gift on ourselves, like not everybody has that gift. It's appointed by God. And then we see that the saints are also have a responsibility to build up the body of Christ. And so the whole church works together to do this work of ministry. And a good analogy of this might be to think of like a football team. You know, if we think of the, the ones who are to equip as kind of the coach, um, you know, they're focused on equipping each person, each player in their giftings and like to, to coordinate them so that when they're on the field, they're able to accomplish their, their task, their goal to, to make it to the end or to, to sink a basket or, you know, if, <clears throat> and, the guide, and to be guided to victory. And so if a team, you know, if, if we have a reverse perspective on it, we think that they're only like a handful of people, the people who are, you know, giving the messages and stuff like that. They're the ones who are doing the ministry. My job is just to, you know, to support them. Well, what we're doing is we're putting the coach out onto the field and we're expecting them to win by themselves. And I've never seen a team do that. And it's like, it, it would, I mean, it'd be, it'd be kind of funny to watch, but it would, it would be devastating for that team because they would never win. Um, and so we see that there's, there's a, there's a, mutual responsibility between everybody in the church to accomplish the work that God has made for us. <clears throat> and so some of the, and some of the ways that leaders equip people are through sound teaching, so sermons definitely, and uh, through intentional discipleship, you know, often we offer classes and and discipleship, you know, different areas in the church for different for different groups of people to help them uh, in their in their giftings, like with, we have men's group, we have youth, we have uh, prayer team and like all of these different things are intended to equip the saints for the work of ministry. You know, I work as a youth director here, and when I see my students uh, coming into youth, whether they know it or not, my goal is to equip them or well to share the gospel with them and to 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 have let them have a faith of their own, but then to also equip them in the gifts that have been especially given to them um, for the work of the ministry because they're going to be able to accomplish things that you know a couple of people are not going to be able to, and especially as the full body of Christ. You know, we all, we're all in this together. It's not like it's only a certain age bracket or a certain set of people. It's the whole body of church builds itself into, builds into each other. And, you know, some, and another way that, you know, you might be discipled or you might be equipped is just through regular conversation. Maybe you got some things going on in your life. 
maybe it's sin, maybe it's just struggles that you're going through that hinder your ability to to work for the work in the ministry. Um, and so sometimes it might be as simple as having a conversation with a leader or a teacher or pastor that you know and, and, and working through some of that and then being equipped to do the work of ministry. It may not happen right away. <clears throat> but then in Ephesians 4 verse 13 it says, the reason that we do this or the reason that the body of Christ might be built up uh, is to reach, or I'll just read it directly here. So to, to starting in verse 12, uh, or sorry, let's start in group verse 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So what happens when we begin to pour into each other, when we're equipped for the works of ministry and we build each other up is actually that we we, we reach unity in, in our faith. Um, our faith becomes stronger and we have more knowledge of who the Son of God is. As a body of believers, we become mature uh, and we attain to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now that's a big statement because that means, you know, the measure is, is Christ. We're to be like Christ. And that seems like a huge task. And you know, if you're sitting there and you're like completely overwhelmed by that, I mean, I don't, I kind of don't blame you because who can say that they're, they're completely like Christ? Like that's a high, high standard to, to reach. And I mean, there's a, there's a verse in first John that I, that we've gone through, we went through in our discipleship group uh, last year. And it said, first uh, John two verse six, and it says, whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. And I mean, that's just a, it's a verse that has always it has, it's, it's not been an easy verse to read because the measure is so high. But I think it's important to, to realize that, you know, that what's being talked about in, in, these, in these verses is that this is a process. This isn't something that just happens, you know. Like when you become a believer, you don't just become immediately good at everything. Maybe, you know, this Holy Spirit's working in you and you're able to do some things that are really extraordinary that you didn't think you were able to. But specifically, God's given people to equip the church so that they can grow into this. So, we're all building when as we as you as you know as people are being equipped for the works of ministry and as we build into each other as the body of Christ what ends up happening is this process of where we become more like Christ and you know people are going to be at maybe at, at, you know starting from different places and that's and that's okay um, we're not leaving anybody behind and we're not like we, we have room for for mess, for making mistakes and, and showing grace in that it's a process <clears throat> yeah, and the result of all of this is going to be maturity in the church and increased unity again. Unity, you'll see, is a, is a big theme in this book. <clears throat> and, we you know, as a mature body of believers, it says that we're going to be planted firm in the truth. We're going to have, uh, we're not going to fall to the hazards, you know. <laughs> like, you know, like we're not going to read the sign and see all the dangers and be like, okay, we got it on our own and try to do it like I did on this trail and then also be surprised by uh, when the danger comes. We know that there's going to be danger if we fail to equip ourselves. We're just making ourselves vulnerable to that danger. Uh, and we're able to stand against and the danger that's specifically uh, mentioned in this in this, in this this portion of Scripture is, uh, is told to us in verse 14. And it says, Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. You know, this is that sign before the trail. This is where it's telling us, you know, some of the dangers that are lying ahead of us. You know, there's a lot of different teachings out there that are going to be convincing to us. And there's going to be a lot of things that, you know, are purposefully deceitful that people are scheming. And so in order to avoid that, we must mature with one another. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, and we'll just finish it up, this, this portion of scripture here in verses 15 to 16. Instead, speaking the truth in love, instead of falling victim to all of these schemes and stuff, instead speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So we've gone through this, this verse, these chapters, or this, this section of verses now in this chapter 4. And so we have this recognition that while we are individuals and we've each been saved by grace through Christ, that we, while we are these individuals who have been saved, we are also brought into this body 
and we've been united into the spirit by into this body. Okay? Our maturity is kind of dependent on one another. Maybe not all of it, but certainly certainly some of it um, in terms of growing and becoming unified in the faith and in the truth of who Christ is. And, you know, I mentioned that unity is a big uh, theme in in this chapter, and it really is. You know, it, it's how, in the beginning, remember, we start in unity by the Spirit. We're made into this body. And then we're actually told to to keep this unity and and to pursue it. It's it's an intentional thing where we intentionally keep unity with with believers. <clears throat> and um, right, yeah, we intentionally keep youth, and as we mature and as we build it into one another, the result is again unity. And so we can see how you know the church is meant to be united with one another. In John thirteen verse thirty five. Um, Jesus said to his disciples, by this all people will know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. And so it's not really this optional thing of where we can have our faith and then be ostracized from the rest of the body of Christ. We're actually told that the exact opposite, we're supposed to keep in unity and, and to love one another. And by that love, people are going to see us and they're going to know that we're followers of Christ. And yeah, I think that paints a beautiful picture of what the body of Christ is to be and how we're supposed to represent, represent Christ. And, you know, we will have differences, you know, unity doesn't mean that we're all the same. And, you know, when I was on that trail and Speedo Man walked ahead of me, um, you know, we don't have the same fashion sense. I'm probably never going to wear a Speedo. But in the moment when he was helping me out, you know, I, was, I wasn't too concerned about the differences we had because we had that shared commonality of like, well, saving my life maybe. Um, but how much more do we have when we engage as believers? You know, we have a, a much greater... Um, similarities. We have the same faith. We have the same God. We have the same hope of salvation. And so, you know, the differences that each of us have are not shouldn't shouldn't be the things that separate us. Our unity should be dependent on what we have in common with one another. And it reminds me of a story of when I was in Bangladesh uh, in 2013, and we had spent a couple of weeks ministering and kind of we were in this kind of unreached place, and so we were doing a lot of prayer walks, and we hadn't really seen a lot of other believers. But then one day we we did we we came across them and and we we spent time together and we built each other up and I just remember how uplifting that was and how you know we were two different groups of, diff, of people from different from different places and we probably didn't have the same denomination or anything but the fact that we both believed in Christ was such a relief to us and was such so refreshing to us that we could build into each other <clears throat> and we and the truth is we need each other. We know that there's a spiritual battle going on around us. It's not a question of if there is and when there's going to be dangers. It's like there are. And we need to be able to be equipped for that. <clears throat> so I think there's a couple of steps that we can take as, as a body to, in order to start stepping towards this idea of being equipped and allowing ourselves to be equipped. The first thing that I would suggest that we should do is that we should commit ourselves to learning the truth about God. Don't neglect don't neglect learning. You know, spend time with trusted leaders and, and you know, listen to sermons of people you trust. Um, and, and take it to the Word. Study it for yourself as well. Do some personal study and continue to grow in your knowledge. Uh, if, you, if you don't know what your giftings are, if you, if you know you're a believer, but you don't know how God's gifted you for the work of ministry, I would say maybe this time is a great opportunity to find, start finding out what some of those gifts are. And we, there's, a, there's a great... Um, We've, we've offered a course called Kazone in the past, which is a course specifically designed to help you figure some of that stuff out. What are your giftings and maybe where is, has God led you and where is he leading you to in the future? And while we're not offering it quite right now, we, there is a spiritual gifts link that we can, that we can offer. Uh, and we'll, we'll post that on the bottom of this video so that you can access that for yourself as well. And once you kind of know what your giftings are, maybe it's time to start asking for advice on how to use them. I would so that we, prayer is a big part of it. Ask God how those giftings that he's given you are to be used and ask leaders how, how you're to be equipped in those things. You know, it, we know that it's the role of the pastors and the teachers and to help equip you for the work of the ministry. So, you know, if, you're, if you feel like it's overwhelming, like um, don't feel like it's all on you. There are people who are designed to equip you for these things. And as we do all of this, as we acknowledge our unity and we preserve it with each other, as we become equipped for the work of ministry, as we build into and serve one another, what's going to end up happening is we're going to become a body of believers that are 
mature. We're going to be confident and equipped in our, in our knowledge and our faith towards Christ. And we're going to become a people who become more like Christ. And I mean, I feel like that's a beautiful picture of the church. Um, it's an active picture of the church. It's intentional. Why don't we grow close together in a word of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today and Lord, and for, for your word to guide us. Lord, thank you that it's not all completely up to us to figure out how to, to do everything and to be everything that you've called us to be at once. Lord, thank you for those who you've given to equip. And Lord, thank you for those who you've specially equipped to, get to, to, to work in the, in the work of the ministry. Lord, we pray that as we build into each other, as we seek unity with one another, and as we build into one another, that we would become the full and mature body of Christ as you have called us to be, um, that we would become more like you and that the world would, through that, would see who you are through our lives and, and how, we've, how we stand firm in, in, in knowing who you are. Lord, we thank you so much for everything you've done for us, for your sacrifice and, and for your grace that you've given to us. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for church this morning. We hope that you want to connect with us throughout the week. And if you do, the best place to do that is on our Facebook or our Instagram. And you can also find more news and events on our Pathway News page if you just go to pathwaycc.net slash news. If you're interested in giving, you can hop online. All of our giving information is on pathwaycc.net slash give. And it has all of the different ways that you can give online. You can give uh, via PayPal, all those kinds of things. So make sure you go up on, on our website site and check out how to give. So thank you so much and we hope to see you next time.